to you all for coming today. I'd like to thank our, our speakers for um, putting together slides and talks and um, views, strong opinions, points for discussion, which should make for a, um, a very exciting morning. I'd like to um, talk very briefly about the ODI Futures series and to emphasize, um, as Catherine's mentioned, this is um, an opportunity for us to get together, share our ideas around a topic that we think is, is highly pertinent to open data and really form the basis for an in-depth and enlightening discussion. I'd like to encourage you to all feel, feel relaxed here, to feel able to um, participate in, in, um, in open and, and stimulating debate. Um, so make yourselves at home. Um, feel free to challenge me, to challenge Catherine, challenge the other speakers, um, all in the name of, of, um, of moving the dialogue forward around open data and, and smart cities. So the theme today is really to, um, is about scaling smart cities. And we want to make an explicit distinction here between, um, or an explicit contrast between scaling open data, or sca scaling smart cities um, from a technical perspective, but more importantly today from a human and social and cultural perspective. And um, by that we mean, um, how do we take the smart city vision, or the various smart city visions that exist, and the various smart city initiatives that exist, and scale them to ensure that they meet the, um, that, that they're defined by individual objectives and that they're measured by the impact on individuals' lives in terms of person-centered outcomes. What can make people's lives better? Um, primarily from a human perspective through the medium of, of technology. So what does that look like in practice? Well, we, th we believe at the ODI that fundamentally a smart city has to be an open city. We don't think that we can scale smart cities in terms of um, person-centered impact, in terms of sustainability, in terms of all the other objectives that people have for smart cities without openness. And um, as you can imagine, when we talk about openness at the ODI, then we think that open data is a strong part of that. But there's a range of other aspects, some of which I've um, highlighted here. And you'll see that the first three really relate to, um, to technical aspects. So open data, open standards, and open infrastructure. And we think that from a technical point of view, these are, are crucial in enabling um, everyone to participate. And that openness extends to building an open culture within the city, some, something that is pervasive. And I don't mean pervasive in the way, necessarily in the way that, that um, we'd like senses to be pervasive, but in terms of something that is embodied in, in individuals, in terms of how they um, experience their city, how they feel they can contribute to their city, and help to shape their, their community and the, um, and the environment around them. And so crucially, this openness has to be for something that everyone can participate in and feel the benefit from. So when I look at this list of five, five opens, then it reminds me of another great infrastructure that we're, um, we're all familiar with, which is the web. Right, so this was, you know, the web emerged from a period of uh, in, intense research on hypertext environments. And until the web came around, none of those had really demonstrated an ability to scale. They hadn't scaled from a technical perspective, geographically, culturally, socially, um, down to the level of the individual. But with the advent of the web, we saw um, open data and open content underpinned by open standards and the infrastructure to enable that content and that, that data to, to propagate. And we've, we feel the effects of that as a result. You know, we have this hashtag here at ODI Futures. Um, we wouldn't be, we, we, we participate in that. The web has, has engendered a culture of openness and partici participation, which we hope will be for everyone. You know, there's, there's still billions of people who, um, who might not feel the benefits of that or, or the benefits or the effects, positive or negative. Um, but we hope that over time then that can be addressed as well. So when we translate this into practice, as I've said before, we think we need to focus the, the discourse of smart cities around people-centered outcomes, not technology solutions. A lot of the, the discourse has been, um, has been driven by people that have um, solutions they're excited about, that they're keen to see deployed, they're keen to see have some, some concrete effect in urban environments. Um, but often we've found that those technology solutions will come first. And I think we need to try and, as a community, try and reframe the debate around what is the impact for the individual? What is the outcome that's going to help improve their, their quality of life or other factors that, that are important to them? So we did a little exercise in the ODI um, recently to try and kind of 
flesh out our understanding or ground our understanding of, of the ODI position on smart cities in um, person-centered initiatives or outcomes. And so we asked a, a group of us within the Institute, what does a smart city mean to you? And crucially, you know, we, we, we didn't want to get bogged down into, oh, I think it's about these sectors, I think it's about transport and waste management and air quality. Um, we wanted to keep it, and we didn't want to keep it at that high level. We wanted to ground it in individual experiences and individual priorities. You know, what makes a difference to, um, to your individual life? And I'm, going to, I was, I'm seeing Adrian in the front row, and I'm, I'm tempted to pick on him, but that would be unfair because I haven't primed him about this. But I think, you know, all take a minute to think what one outcome would you choose? If you could choose anything about your experience in the, the city or town or, or rural environment where you live, what one outcome would, would you choose? You don't have to answer now, but take a moment to think about that. So we chose a bunch of things. When, you know, when, I, when I looked at the notes we'd taken from the meeting, um, and there were a few high-level themes that came out from this. Um, firstly, greater agency over our own surroundings. If this can be an outcome of the smart city vision, where people feel empowered to, to act upon their environment for the good of themselves and their, and their, um, their communities, then that's a great outcome. And, and I think this, um, that comes in the context of um, environments where people might not feel empowered. They might feel acted upon by their urban environment. Um, another theme that came out was all actors taking their share of responsibility. So this is about individuals saying, OK, well, if there's a problem I perceive in my neighborhood, then perhaps it's down to me to take some action to, um, to you know, report the, the broken street lamp, um, fix the pothole, clean up the litter, whatever. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, this is about, about large organizations, um, particularly businesses, um, being held accountable for, for taking and to, to being, being required to take responsibility for the contributions that they make to the, the, um, the performance or the experience of the urban environment. And um, another thing that came out was what I called optimum connectivity. This isn't about everyone getting better broadband, right? This is, <laughs> this is explicitly not the point of this. It's about ensuring a level of connectivity on the, on the, um, the physical and the human level, such that cities and towns and other environments can function in the, in the best possible way. So to give a, a bit more color to this, what I mean is that um, if you assume that um, everyone in a city is going to be strongly connected in a social network sense to, um, or a professional network sense to everyone else, then that's not sustainable or that, or that places constraints on, the, constraints on the size of that community. You can't, probably can't grow that beyond um, a few hundred individuals. Um, similarly, if you assume that everyone in, in a particular neighborhood is strongly connected but has no connections beyond um, to, to neighboring neighborhoods, then you end up effectively with a ghetto or you get a, a sequence of ghettos replicated into some kind of urban sprawl. And I don't think that's optimal either. So we need to balance there the strong connectivity at a neighborhood level. Um, you know, I live, I live in a city and I feel that in my neighborhood, it's like living in a village because I can go down the shops and run into people that I know. And, um, but I also need to be able to experience connectivity and, and meaning and, and positive experience in other parts of the city. Otherwise, it's just, I may as well live in a village, right? So drilling down into more specific examples, then um, one of the, the people in the, in the group flagged up about the relationship between humans and HGVs. So lots of construction work in London, lots of construction work in other cities, and you, know, you walk around the city or cycle around the city and you see massive trucks bringing building materials or taking, taking waste away. And what kind of effect does this have on on the neighborhood or the experience of being a cyclist, being a pedestrian, being someone that wants to sit outside a, um, outside a pavement cafe, and how do those two, um, those two um, priorities, how are they reconciled? Um, we'd like to have um, community spaces that benefit everyone, that are run and operated and, and created with everyone's objectives and, and um, priorities in mind, if we can balance that. And crucially, people would like the ability to raise their kids in the area that they've lived in for 15 years or 30 years or five years um, and be able to afford to do that. So what, what I took out of this when I, when I analyzed these was that there's um, a lot of these, these outcomes, they're completely consistent with the, the, um, the kind of dominant technocratic view of, of smart cities, but that view alone won't get us there. So we need to ask the question, what will get us to that, that place of personal outcomes um, improved quality of life, 
and being able to address the kinds of issues that individuals care about on a day-to-day -day basis. So your brief for today, and this isn't just a brief to the speakers, this is a brief to everyone here who's, who's participating, and by being present, you are participating. Um, so please, use your talks, the questions you raise, the discussions you have in the coffee break to help us move towards that answer and shape what that answer is. Thank you very much.